Father, we pray that this telling and the child that it will cover would bring honor to you and your purpose, and that your covering will always be upon him. In the name of your son, Yeshua. Hallelujah. Amen.
um, everybody should sign this because I didn't want you guys to know that this was coming. If we would have sent it out here for everybody to sign, <laughs> we would have blown the So surprise. thank you, and we'll sign it and send it around. <laughs> yes. 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 Hallelujah. Okay, we're going to be reading from the half Torah portions this week, which will be Jeremiah chapter 1 and the first three verses in chapter 2. <laughs> Father, as we begin to read your word, we ask that you would lead us and guide us, Father, and bless us with understanding that comes from you and your Shamayim. Give us the tools that we need to better understand your ways so that we can seek your kingdom. Glorifying and bringing esteem to your Son and the blood that was shed, and your purpose. And we ask and pray for your guidance in the name of your Son, Yahshua, Baruch Hashem. Okay. <clears throat> Jeremy Yahu, beginning at chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Yahu, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Ananoth, in the land of Benjamin. Right away, a few things that I wanted to point out um, is these two names that we see in the opening verses. Usually in the Hebrew context, whenever you see two names brought up in one instance, it serves us well to look at the meaning of those two people's names. Here we have a son of Jacob, okay, involved with a prophet. So there is a message behind just their names alone. Um, Yeremi Yahu is number 3414 in the Hebrew. And it means Yahweh will rise. Now, the name Benjamin is number uh, 14, uh, uh, excuse me, 1114 in the Strong's. And it means son of the right hand. You see the significance to that alone? Mm -hmm. That Yahweh is going to rise, and that's without even going to the, to the hieroglyphics here, by the son of his right hand. Mm -hmm. Yeremi Yahu was a son that was going to minister to who? The son of the right hand, Benjamin, which was the youngest son of Yaakov. So the significance, even in just those two names alone, show us an, a very deep meaning of what we're about to get into, Hallelujah, as we're going to see. Um, remember that Jeremy Yahu has something to do with Yahweh rising, to arise, to awake, you'll see there in the Hebrew, which is something that we get into when we end up doing our word study here. This, this chapter and, and uh, part of the next chapter has something to do with Yahweh's servant telling his people to rise. Through the prophets. Their word. Because they spoke only the word of the Father. Hallelujah. Alright. Verse 2. To whom the word of Yahweh came. See, so here we see that these two men are directly connected. And, and we're talking about the tribe of Benjamin here. So these would be the descendants. Those who were in the land of Benjamin. In the days of Jeremiah. To whom the word of Yahweh came in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, sovereign of Yehuda, in the thirteenth year of his reign. And it came in the days of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, sovereign of Yehuda, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, sovereign of Yehuda, until the exile of Jerusalem in the fifth month. So here we see a time frame going down of a group of people that refused to listen to the prophet's warnings. And we're seeing that today. People are refusing to, to take heed to the prophet's writings. Moshe was a prophet. Aaron prophesied. You see what I'm saying? All of these things are always connected back to that what, what we were warned 
to do through the prophets. And we will get, not, I'm not saying we as these, us here in the room today, but the nations of the world, those we's, okay, will receive the same judgments. And it's a warning for us to take heed to when we heed the words of the prophets. Verse 4. Now the word of Yahweh came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you, and before you came out of the womb, I did set you apart. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And I said, Ah, Master Yahweh, see, I do not know how to speak, for I am a youth. See, many of us, many, this, is, this is something very symbolic that we need to understand. From the youngest in the group to the oldest in the group. You are to be used by the master. You will be his servant until the day they throw dirt in your face. You will be his servant until we're either alive at his coming and we have a job to do, whether it be small, big, great, or little. We all have a purpose in Yahweh's kingdom and in his reign. Verse 7, And Yahweh said to me, Do not say I am a youth, but go to all whom I send you, and speak whatever I command. You see, this is what Yahweh does. He places his word in us so that we don't speak what we think the people need to hear, or what we think about the scripture, but what the word itself institutes. And that's how we become ambassadors of Yahweh, kings and priests in his reign. When we speak only the things pertaining to the kingdom that came from the kingdom. Verse 8, do not fear their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, declares Yahweh. Then Yahweh put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And Yahweh said to me, See, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the reins to root you, to, to root out and to pull down, to destroy, to overthrow, to build, and to plant. There is the good news coming from a prophet hundreds of years prior to Yahshua HaMashiach coming into this world. He's sending one man into his people and telling them, you need to remember what you were supposed to plant, sow, and reap for me. And then we get such verses in the Brit HaDashah, such as the, the, the servant that hid his talent. He didn't plant that seed. He put it away. But many people say the same thing today. I just want to be at the feet of the Master. That's all they're worried about. When the master has told us time and time again that we will come in front of him by the millions and bow before him, we shall never be alone. That's what the mishpachah is all about. So that we don't have to be alone in trials and tribulations. And if a brother fall down, he always has a brother to pick him up. The threefold cord. The whole story remains the same from cover to cover. And it all has to do with family. To love, to bless, to plant, to reap, to sow. And, and this, this whole thing um, that Yahweh has shown me in these portions came, came to me after me receiving emails and stuff of, uh, again, some... Um, Preachers from churchanity emailed me and said, Brother, you're wrong. It has changed. And they say, J.E.S.U.S. changed it for me. He just hasn't changed it for you. So let it be written. So let it be done. Time and time again in Scripture, we see that Yahweh changes not. Thank goodness that he remains faithful to his covenant and to his people. And that he doesn't change. And we should pray that in the end that these people that are wrapped up in these things, Yahweh will show them and spare them and show them mercy. Prior, our prayer should be that they receive the knowledge of the truth prior to Yahshua coming back. So that they can come into the family. We're going to make some connections in these few verses here. Uh, verse 10, see I have this day set you over the day. He's talking to one man here, you guys. He's talking to Yahoo. 
And in verse 10 he says, See, I have set this day, or I have this day set you over the nations and over the reigns to root out, pull down, to destroy, to overthrow, to build, and to plant. So this should be our response to people who say such things as, we're wrong, it did change. The new covenant is totally different. Let's make some connections real quick, you guys. In verse 7 we see here, And Yahweh said to me, not to say, uh, Do not say that I am a youth, but go to all whom I send you, and speak whatever I command you. Now remember, who said this? Through Yeremiah? Yahweh. Yahweh. Yeah. Yahweh said this. Right? Yeah. Let's go into the Brit Hadashah, or most commonly known as the New Testament, and read something real quick. Let's go to Mark chapter 16. Take a look at verses 15 through 19. This is speaking about Yahshua. Verses 15 through 19 in Mark chapter 16. And he said to them, Go into all the world. And proclaim the good news to every creature. The same exact words that we just seen Yahweh speak through the prophet Jeremiah. It's the same story, the same process, cover to cover. Now explain to me how it has changed. Just by looking at this one verse, but we're going to look at another one to confirm some things. Let's keep reading there. Verse 16. He who... Uh, he who has believed and has been immersed shall be saved. But he who has not believed shall be condemned. And these signs shall accompany those who believe in my name. They shall cast out demons. They shall speak with renewed tongues. And I remember we just went over that in our Shavuot teaching. It, ha it happened at Shavuot. All right. Verse 18. And they shall take up snakes. And if they drink any deadly drink... That's talking about things you consume. I've seen some extremists, and let me forewarn everybody, I don't think we have anybody in the room that would try this. But to those who will be watching by DVD or internet, um, I know some extremists that were handling rattlesnakes and poisonous snakes, and um, one of them got bit. And he stood firm on this verse and other verses like it, like when Shaul was bit by the serpent. And he stood firm and said, I will not die from this. J-E-S-U-S says, and I'm going to live. And you know where he's at 16 hours later? In the grave. One reason why is because these people are not doing the right thing and looking at the context of the scripture, going to the Greek and going back to the Hebrew to see what it actually means. Mm -hmm. My advice to anybody that gets bit by a rattler, get to the hospital. And pray along the way. But let's get there and get it taken care of. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. And they shall take up snakes, and if they drink any deadly drink, it shall by no means hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall get well. Then indeed, after the master had spoken to them, he was received up in the heaven and set down at the right hand, meaning authority. Remember, right hand in Hebrew is a sign of power, strength, and authority. And we just saw that at the beginning when we looked at one of the names of these men. See how it, it always coincides once you understand these idioms. To set at the right hand of Elohim, it means that he was standing and representing the, the, uh, the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, just as we're supposed to do if we are his ambassadors. Okay, going back to Yeremiah Yahoo.
in verse 8 in chapter 1, it says, Do not fear their faces, for I am with you to deliver you. All right? Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 28. Let's see if Yahweh changed in between this time and the time that Yahshua was speaking these things to his disciples once again. We've heard these verses read probably when I was in churchanity. I heard them read and, and preached by every minister I ever came across at least a few times a month. It was in somebody's message. Let's read this. Now knowing what we know, let's, let's read this and try to make some sense out of it. Because it didn't mean what we were being told it meant. Mm -hmm. All right? Because now we know that the message never changed. We're looking at what was told to the people uh, in uh, the days of Jeremiah. Now let's look at the same exact thing being said here by Yahshua. Once again, it not changing. All right? Let's look at verses 18 through 20. And Yahshua came up and spoke to them, saying, So here we see, Yahweh was speaking through Yahu to the people in the nation of Israel. And we've seen what he spoke. Now let's look and see what Yahshua is speaking to the people in the same area hundreds of years later. And explain to me how we can, we can take the concept that it changed anywhere when we see the repetitive words time and time and time again from point A to point Z. I'm not in error. We are not in error as a group. They are in error. It didn't change. Yahweh said, He doesn't change. He won't change. He's not going to. And Yahshua came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Shemaim and Aretz. Right? Therefore go, make top ones of the nation. See? He's telling them the same thing. Just like he told Jeremiah. I want you to go in here and I want you to bring this good news to them. Immersing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the set apart spirit. We're going to come back to that and cover that real quick. Uh, teaching them to guard all that I have commanded. What was Jeremiah told to do to the people when he went in there? Remind them of everything that they had said I do to at the covenant. At Mount Sinai. And see... I am with you always until the end of the age. And we just came from Jeremiah. Do not fear their faces, for I am with you to deliver you. Yahshua says, I am with you. Tell them my commandments. I am with you. Do not fear. It's the same message to the nations now as it was then. The reason why he was speaking to the children of Israel then is because they had joined themselves to the other nations by worshiping their mighty ones. So then they were in need of a prophet to come to them even in Yahweh's house and warn them of what would happen if they didn't straighten up. And this should be our incentive in the center of our household, in the center of our fellowship, and in the center of our personal ministry to other people. It did not change. Here's the scriptural proof. Some of it. Okay. Now going back to this, and you shall immerse them uh, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the set-apart spirit. Going back into the Hebrew, it paints a totally different picture, and I and so I, I kind of transliterated what, what I came up with when I researched all this back to the Hebrew. And I believe, if you, if you look at this stuff too in your own personal studies, that this is what that verse is saying. We know that Yahweh is a spirit, correct? And that spirit is holy. It's Kodesh, right? So that's the Kodesh spirit. 
There's only one spirit. Mm -hmm. There's only one ruach, one breath. See, that, that word means breath. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean separate entity. It's not an entity. It's breath. It's what we breathe. It's life. Okay? Mm -hmm. So knowing that Yahweh is a spirit, and that spirit is Kodesh, then the rest of this makes sense once you understand what the spirit is. It is his breath. It's not an entity. It doesn't have anything to do with deity. Church entity has deified everything mm -hmm. because they worship deities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so every time we receive these uh, uh, teachings from church entity, it's going to be according to those types of thinking uh, processes. But knowing that it's his breath, and he is that breath, now let's go back to the Father, Son, and Kodesh Spirit here. All right? Yah is the Father, and the Father is Yah. The name of the Father who is Yah is Yahweh Shua, for he has saved his people from their sins. When you look at the Hebrew and you see Yahweh's deliverance in the, in the, uh, in the Tanakh, you look at that in the English and they're spaced there by some separate English words, but in the Hebrew it's not that way. It's Yasha or Yeshua and um, the, the Hebrew word for deliverance, which is Yasha or Yesh. Okay, and then Yahweh's name in the same sentence. Yahweh's deliverance. That's why we see the short form spelt now, Yahshua. So what it's saying is, is the Father is Yah and Yah is the Father. And the name of the Father who is Yah is Yahweh Shua because he has saved his people from their sin. Matthew 1.21. They're not three separate entities is what I'm trying to say. And in the Hebrew, when you, try, when you go back in the Hebrew, it shows you that. But if people want to stay wrapped up in modern teachings, that's fine. We'll just continue to pray for them. But how be it, in my studies, it's not a different good news once you get to what they call the New Testament. It's not. It's the same story cover to cover. Hallelujah. All right. Now, continuing on in Jeremiah. <laughs> Fix that. We fixed, we fixed that. it, yeah. I'm glad Telmer's back because I've been needing some uh, help drawing. Some of those figures are, are pretty hard to figure out, so I'm going to spend some time with Telmer. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, verse 11 in chapter 1. And the word of Yahweh came to me, saying, What do you see, Yahu? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. And Yahweh said to me, You have seen well, for I am watching over my, my word to do it. And the word of Yahweh came to me a second time, saying, What do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot, and it is facing away from the north. And Yahweh said to me, Out of the north, evil is set loose, on all the inhabitants of the land. So here we see that he's passing judgment. He's telling them, I'm going to pass judgment on you if you don't repent. Verse 15, For look, I am calling, and the clans of the reigns of the north, declares Yahweh, and they shall come, and each one set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. Do you see what happened here? The enemy is plugging the gates of the city with its own inhabitants instead of, remember in the book of Revelation we have the new Yerushalayim come down and then there was 12 gates that's because in Yahshua those 12 gates are open again, Yahweh stopped them There's, there was no access because of the disobedience of the people that were in the land Okay then, if you don't want to keep this land Kodesh, if you don't want to keep your heart true to me and me alone, if you do not want to follow that which you in the covenant said I do to, then we'll just let the Gentiles have the land. That's what's going to happen if you don't repent. What has happened to the world's hearts? It's been inhabited by the enemy. Okay. Verse 16, and I shall pronounce my judgments against them.
concerning all their evil because they have forsaken me, burned incense to other mighty ones. And remember, sometimes that burning of incense correlates with what we see in, in the book of Revelation where the, the prayers going up and all of that. See, their, their worship was being directed in another direction. And he's going, hey, what about our covenant? Didn't you mean what you said to me when I brought you out of Egypt and you followed me? You looked to me for your light, for your shelter, for your covering. You looked to me for everything, and I want that back. But if you don't come back to me, I'm going to give you over to a reprobate mind, if that's what you want. This prophecy is, is, is very, very deep concerning what we go through today mm -hmm. in the world and all of its religions. We see the after effects of the disobedience. They didn't repent and we know what happened and it will not be any different for us as a nation, as a family, or as a people, or as a single person. It's not going to change. Burned incense to other mighty ones and bowed themselves to the works of their own hands. Now remember that. That's, that we need to remember that. The bowing to the works of their own hands. And I'll tell you where we get in trouble is when we say, well, I, the way I look at that verse or the way I see that, or you know what? I bow down to this and that and this. I think I should worship like this. That's what gets you in trouble, trouble with him because all you have to do is look at the word and it tells you how to worship him. It's that simple. Verse 17, this, this is the verse that we're going to come back to and do the word study in. Uh, now gird up your loins. Now he's speaking directly to Yahoo here. And this is, and I see this. He's speaking to Bethany Wilkes, Art Wilkes, and every woman in this room, and me, everybody in this room. He's speaking the same word. He's not going to send a, a different message to you and I. If we're ambassadors, like Jeremy Yahoo was, he's going to tell us to do the same thing that's been the same plan since the fall of man in the garden. It's not, it's not going to change. It can't change. Because then the overall plan and purpose would change, and a different people would become the bride. Now gird up your loins, and remember this word, arise. Remember, we just seen that word when we looked at those two names in verse 1. Matter of fact, uh, it, uh, Jeremy Yahoo's name has something to do with Yahweh rising. Or it can mean awakening once you go into the hieroglyphics there. It can mean to awake. And that's what a prophet does. Wake up, you guys. That's why you see those Hebrew characters in his name. Because that's what he was trying to do through the prophets. Get his people, his bride, to wake up. Why? Because half of them's oil is burning out. They don't have any more. Oh, Father, help us. Arise and speak to them all that I have commanded you. Do not break down before their faces, lest I break you before them. We'll come back to that. For look, I have made you this day a walled city. He's talking to one man. He says, I have made you, just like he told Moshe when they were disobedient. He said, I'm going to kill everybody else. I'm going to make a nation just out of you. Could have did the, he did the same thing with Abraham. Same plan there as well. He tell, he's talking to Jeremy Yahoo. For look, I have made you this day a walled city and an iron column a, and bronze walls against the land. He took one man that, out of his people and told him, I am making you a walled city today against them if they do not repent. I will start from scratch with you. And it begins with us in this room. It begins with all of the Mishpachah throughout the world. Against the sovereigns of Yehuda, against her heads, against her priests, and against the people of the land. And I submit to you that that's still who he's against over there. We have a lot of people calling themselves a Kohen or a priest over there that have nothing to do with the genealogy of Zadok. Sacrifices offered to...
Verse 19, and they shall fight against you. And this is what we can look forward to. This might have been what Art was expecting whenever this thing with Shabbat popped up in his job. And he was like, I've never had to worry about that before. But what did they do? They prayed and, and everything. And it actually turned out to be an opportunity for him to testify who he believed in and why. And why he held Shabbat as a Kodesh day in his life. Hallelujah. He's got a blessing hovering over his head that just came into the family. And they shall fight against you, but not prevail. And let me go ahead and say this happens to us a lot whenever we try to minister to somebody who's in church anity. They'll fight against you. They'll say, I can call him anything I want. I know his name's Joshua. I know the Father's name is Yahweh, but I can use that. I can do this. You're wrong. I'm right. When the word, time and time again, when you look at the, the Hebrew, it, it's showing you totally the opposite. Mm -hmm. Rebellion. Rebellion. But they, but not prevail against you is the promise here in this verse. For I am with you, declares Yahweh, to deliver you. And that word deliver is either going to be connected to Yasha or Yeshua, the verbs. Remember, Yeshua is not a noun. That just means deliverance, delivered, or, or deliver. It's a verb. It's not a noun. Yahweh Shua, though the short form, Yahshua, is the, is the personal noun of the Savior. Uh, chapter 2, the first three verses there. And the word of Yahweh came to me, saying, Go, you shall cry in the hearing of Yerushalayim, saying, Thus said Yahweh, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your bridehood, Vance, Jill, do you remember the day that you said I do at the altar? Do you remember the love and the joy and the commitment that you felt toward one another? How happy you were as a man to know that your bride had came to you. Art, Bethany, those vows, that's what Yahweh misses. That's what we're fighting to bring back. He wants us to remember our youth as a bride when we came to him and fell on his feet and said, thank you for saving me. And because I'm so grateful, I'm willing to do anything for you. He just wants to be loved. this again when they came out of Egypt and they said oh thank you for delivering us and just months later denying his name his commands he just wants to reestablish the love between him and his wife and if every man that ever said I do at any altar, whatever it is, once even they came to the knowledge of Yahweh, if they had that mentality, there would be no divorce and adultery in this world. Help us fall. I remember you in the kindness of your youth, the love of your brighthood, when you went after me in the wilderness. So I remember when you used to chase me around. I remember when I used to get in my car and every time I turned the corner there you were passing me by and, and waving and winking at me and just those little things and instead of a wink and a wave today he gets a brush and a wave but yet he endures but he's proven that he will not put up with disobedience and adultery he said okay that I won't put up with and he divorced, as we're reading, Israel first and Yehuda. He's not going to replace a disobedient people in his house with another disobedient people. 
Verse 3. No, excuse me. Finishing verse 2. When you went after me in the wilderness, in the land that was not sown. It was barren then. Not until you came into my presence were you taken into a place of holiness, of rest and peace, and fruit. I've given you meat, manna. I've given you the bread of life. And I want you to come back to that. That is the message. That is the same message that was preached by Yahu. It's the same message that was being preached by Yahshua and his disciples. And it's going to be the same message that you're coming out of my mouth. Verse 3. Yisrael was set apart to Yahweh. The first fruits of his increase, all who ate of it became guilty. Evil came upon them, declares Yahweh. He just wants us to come back. He's beckoning everybody. Yahshua was that, that shofar blast, that whistle, if you will, to come back home. Come back into covenant with me where you can be fed and nurtured. Let me take care of you. I want to rub your feet. I want to massage you. I want to, I want to, I want to caress your body. I want to love you again. But if you're way over there in the corner and you're not going to come within the uh, gates of the house, how am I supposed to do that? All you got to do is read on the doorposts of the home. They're nailed there in the mezuzahs all over the place. Come in here. These are the rules. But behind all those rules is a multitude of majesty in his presence coupled with love unfathomable. I want that. I want that for everybody here and the whole world. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Now, we'll get to the word study. See, I told you guys it wouldn't be that long. <laughs> it's all good. Hallelujah. Okay. Going back up here to verse 17 in chapter 1. He's telling Yahu, now gird up your loins and arise. We're going to be, uh, just briefly go into that one. We'll come back to it. But I want to focus on these two words that we see there. In most English versions where you see, let's read here, and speak to them all that I command you. Do not break down, we see in the scriptures. Uh, in most other English versions, including the word of Yahweh, you'll see uh, uh, be dismayed there. It says, uh, do not break down before their faces, lest I break you. We see the other set of words, and in most English translation, that one um, is translated as, uh, I will confound you. But, as I started researching that, it comes through, or from, the same Hebrew word. That's why you'll see in the scriptures, they, they kind of kept it, pretty well translated because it has to do with breaking not being dismayed or confounded that kind of waters down what he was saying there um, to break down he says if you break down before them I'm going to break you before them why? Yahu, I've placed my ruach in you and I've given you my word you walk with your head up and your chest out as an ambassador when you go in there and don't you take nothing from these people we are not supposed to humble ourselves before any man. Especially if you look at the Hebrew there. That means to bow down. To be meek. Yes. Towards other people and those who are outside. But to humble yourself before somebody. I wouldn't suggest you do that. Because that's what he's telling him here. But you bow down to them. They bow to me. And you represent me. You get them to bow to me. I don't fear. I'm with you. Yeshua told us the same thing. In, in the world, you're going to receive tribulation, but be of good courage. Don't fear. I will retain the world. Hi. It's the same message. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
We need to get little Jack up here sometime to, to bring the message. We have one now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, so looking at these words real fast, um, you guys will need the handouts. And we'll begin with this one that's a copy out of Jeff Benner's ancient uh, Hebrew lexicon, minus the hieroglyphics. I still can't figure that out, how to get them to print. But you'll be able to see the definitions. And then we'll go to this one that gives us the meaning and the picture of the Hebrew letters. You want to highlight in that one okay. the eighth line <coughs> and the second to the bottom, which is the head and the top. That's the second one from the bottom and the eighth row down. Did you find it, sister? Now, when I started studying these words after I, I looked at it and I seen that it was break down and break you, and then in most English versions it said dismayed and confounded, it was kind of intriguing because I was like, well, what's that got to do with those, these letters show something good? If you look at it, and we'll come back to that. First, let's study um, just the, the abstract definition, and then we'll go into that. But this is a huge revelation. When Yahweh says something, he means it. And at times, there's going to be some repercussions if you don't do it. And that's what he's telling, Yer telling Yeremi Yahweh right here. What he's saying is, My son, I am entrusting you with a huge job. And you daughters, same thing. He's entrusting you with a mighty job. You are carrying Yahshua, to these people, the Word delivers. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt in. You, when you bring the spoken Word to any person, you are bringing Yahshua into their life. And when He reveals His Son in the flesh to them, the package is complete. Israel has not been cast away. They do believe in the Mashiach. They have the eternal Word. They just forgot its name. They're still stiff-necked, many of them, but not all of them. But he's telling Yahu, son, I'm sending you in here to represent me. This is a huge job. I need you to go in there, and I need you to be brave. Not saying that you're my only hope, because it's going to come to pass, no matter who i got to use. But this is a very important job for you. And... At the same time, a very, very deep test of faith. And we have this same order. Okay. Going first to the Strongs, it's number 2865. It's the same Hebrew word here for both of those that we just read in Jer uh, Jeremiah. Number 2865 in the Hebrew is kapah. Kapah in Hebrew. Right. And it's made up of a het, ta, and ta. Now, once we go back to these two letters, that's the two-letter root of this whole thing. Remember, first it was just Bethany and Art, and then blink, 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 other letters are still. We, we need a bigger chalkboard to get with their, their family's program way over here. Hallelujah. Okay? But what we're seeing is uh, this is going to end up being the two-letter root of this word. Okay? The abstract definition that we see in the Strong's is a primitive root, properly to prostrate. Now we see what he was saying. Don't be afraid. We see fear there. and when I, I wanted to go there with this whole study and do the fear part and all of that, but this would have... Yeah, this would have been a long one. Okay? 
but we can understand just by the context, when we take the context of the scripture and apply it to just the use of a couple of sets of words in there, we can see the big picture. He was telling them, do not go in there and prostrate yourself before these people. Matter of fact, gird up your loins and arise. That doesn't mean that you're prideful. When a man of Yahweh is given a job to do, he keeps his chin up and his chest out. He keeps, uh, you know, you, you want to be a, a, a representation, an image of the Father. You don't, you don't go into a nation of people that he's trying to get to repent like this. Um, excuse me. Um, I need your attention. People in the world today will eat you alive. But if you come to people and you say, I have a word from Yahweh. Yahweh has sent me here today to give you a word. You know what that used to get? Even the attention of the Sanhedrin. Everybody in the whole temple stopped what they were doing and they came and they broke out the pads. And they would say, what is your message to us? And if they were supposed to be a prophet, they would write it down. And if it didn't come to pass throughout history, that man was labeled a false prophet. And he didn't get put in this book. But here we see that there was a bunch of them, okay, that they wrote, that, that what they said was going to happen has happened. Once again, I submit to the critics out there that say that it's a different story. By the time you get to the Brit Shah, explain that one. I mean, don't explain it away. Explain how it could be. When all of the prophecies that came to pass in the Messianic Scriptures... Okay, so that's just one word there. It says to prostrate, hence to break down. So here we see that the scriptures have that translated a lot better than most English versions. That's this one. Now it's also the same Hebrew word as we as we keep reading. You do not break, break down before their faces, lest I break you. And a lot of people are saying confound you there in most English translations. All right, it's the same exact Hebrew word. So many times whenever you see the same word, especially when it comes to sin, hell, and other words like that, you need to understand that that word sin has many has been translated into one word from many different uh, Hebrew words. And the highest form, like I was speaking to Brother Art about earlier, is malach. It's, it's, it's the highest form of treason or iniquity that can be... Uh, sinned against the Father. So they're different words that they translate into sin and we need to, before we come to the wrong understanding, we need to verify what type of sin because that's got something to do with the type of sin offering and peace offering. This peace might not be the same peace that they were talking about offering for back here. This peace offer, offering might be for something that he'd done in order to free them from slavery, in order to free them from war, in order to uh, bless, to bless him for something that he's given the family. Different types of words for peace and sin and everything else. But we've got all kinds of enigmas and false doctrines out there just looking at the English going, no, it says here, sin. Yeah, but is that same sin here, the same Hebrew word as it says back here? We, we have became so doctrinally unsound in some areas because of what you know, translation after translation after translation has, has done, that we, we miss the mark sometimes. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, that's going to take us off the stage. What I'm saying is we don't have the proper understanding or the ability to minister to others because of it. Okay. So, it also says to prostrate, break down, literally by violence or by confusion and fear. What he's telling Yahoo right here is, after reading that definition, I want you to go in there. I want you to keep your head up. Don't fear them. I'm going to cause them to fear you. Because you're bringing my word with you. Don't you prostrate yourself to them because they are worshiping other mighty ones. They are bowing to other mighty ones. And if you bow to them, 
That's why Abraham wouldn't take the offerings of the other countries that were saying, make a covenant with us. No, thank you. I'm already in covenant with my husband. Don't you bring me flowers. I've already accepted flowers. And he's telling, telling Yahoo the same thing here. Don't you accept anything from them. You go in there and dish it out. I'm not sending you in there to, uh, to, to be afraid. I'm not sending you in there to do anything other than to deliver my word. They're not going to want to hear it. But nevertheless, they're going to fight against it. But I'll protect you. He was beat up, thrown into prison many times. And one time he even said, I'm not going to speak in this name to them anymore. But he said, the word burned within me. And I couldn't withhold it. See, that's the passion and the zeal that he has given us. That's the passion and the zeal that it takes to go into a nation of people or into a church or into uh, somebody's home and say, you're not going to like this. Did you know that... You call the Savior by the wrong name? And you just wait for something to come flying across the room or something, you know. It hasn't changed. It's the same effects of the same message. Cover to cover. Okay, now... Let's get to the bottom of this. Um, looking at this piece of paper, 1183 in Jeff Minner's Ancient Hebrew Lexicon takes us down to 1183 subsection V at the bottom of the page there. That's where you would see these characters that wouldn't print for some reason, but you guys would be able to see the definition. Now here is a, and to all of the critics that want to jump us because the scriptures aren't the King James that we have and read from to have them go to this when it gets posted and tell them to open their King James and to read this verse and to watch very carefully and give them if they need a set of the scriptures let us know we'll get them to them the scripture says break down and break you in that verse there says To be dismayed and confounded. In the scriptures, we're going to read right now what that, what these three letters actually mean in Hebrew in the ancient hieroglyphics. Jeff Binner's lexicon says that that word means break. So look at the King James where it says dismayed and confounded. And then look at the scriptures. Break, break. Two properly translated words in the scriptures versus two mistranslations in most other English versions. Again, where's your argument? Here's the proof. The scriptures and other uh, sets of scriptures like them, there's, it's no hands down better translations because Yahweh's beginning to show his people as they study a closer rendition of his word because he said, if you draw nigh unto me, I'm going to draw an eye unto you. When he draws near to you, you better bet that you've got some understanding, visions, and wisdom coming that come from him and him alone. And nine times out of ten, it's going to contradict almost all things that we've learned in church hands. So true. Okay, so now what I want to do, we see, we see there it says break. That's the concrete meaning of the word. And the definition is to be broken in fear or terror. And that has something to, that's why they translated that verse this way in the, in, the, uh, in the scriptures. Now gird up your loins and arise and speak to them all that I command you to do. Do not break down before their faces, lest I break you before them. To be broken in fear. See what he's saying? Don't fear them. Fear me. And as long as you fear me, you have no worries. He's your friend. He's going in before you, and he's your rear guard. How can you lose that fight? I mean, as long as you're looking forward and doing what he said to do, you don't have to worry about your back. I remember when I was living in the world and in trouble, there were many times where something would happen in an area that wasn't... I shouldn't have been, but I was. When... When everything was done, there was a guy, we were both back to back, just trying to keep people off of each other. 
We don't have to worry about that anymore. Because Yahweh's got my back. All we have to do is stay focused and go forward and do what he said to do and speak what he said to speak. The rest he will do for us. Okay, so here we see that definition. Now let's go back up to the top of the page where it says 1183. You're going to see the action root where it says AC means to break. Then we see abstractly it can mean fear. See, and that's what he was telling Jeremy Yahoo. Don't fear being broken and don't you let them break you with their words. They're going to rise up against you, but I'm going to strengthen you and fill you with my Ruach. There's no need to be afraid. You're a one-man game. Get in there, bud. Put me in, coach. I'm ready to play. <laughs> but see, finding, finding a soul, a being, a spirit, a man, a woman, or a child willing to take on that responsibility is where the weakness is. It's not in, the weakness isn't in Yahweh or his Ruach. And the world has got that upside down saying it is. What it is, is finding somebody who's willing to save despite the odds. There is so many things stacked against me and my flesh is telling me do not go in there because there's millions of people I'm only one man. But every now and then he runs across a man or a woman or a child that says, it doesn't matter. If my life is over today, I'll be one step closer to you. If they take my life today and my eyes close, when they open again, I will be in your presence. And I am willing to go in there and speak this word to these people so that they can be saved if I live or die. That is what Yahweh is looking for, and that's what's hindering the good news from going to the world. Who wants to take on the responsibility and equip themselves with the good news? Hallelujah. I do. And I know that you do or you wouldn't be here. Hallelujah. Now, the two-letter root is that. That would be the head and the top. Now, this is where it started getting confusing for me because I was like, wait a minute, those are good letters. Now, look at your diagrams there, and let's look at the head. Its picture is a tent, a tent wall, or a fence, right? And the top represents a mark, or excuse me, it represents the crossed sticks, okay? And we know that the crossed sticks, to us, we know who that represents. So looking at these two words, you go, well, that, that would almost contradict everything we're reading in the English here because those two words have something to do. A tent reminds you of the tent of meeting, the... the the uh, tall reminds you of a sacrifice or or something good. Yeah, to bring up. And here we see that we see a rise here. We're going to go back to that. That's going to be the last word we're studying right here. But looking at the context and the meaning, that's why these things are set up in this way. First, they'll show you what they represent in the picture, but then they're going to give you a definition. Before, and, it's, and it's labeled under meaning, where the definition is. It says meaning. Okay, before you go to the meaning, after you look at the picture and what it means, I suggest that you read the scripture one more time because you must go to the meaning with the frame of mind of the context of the scripture or you're not going to be able to understand it because these are actually good things. Tent, tent of meaning, stake, sacrifice, so on and so forth, right? Let's read this again. Now gird up your loins and arise and speak to them all that I command you. Do not break down before their faces, lest I break you before them. Now, keeping that in mind, let's look at the meaning of the het. 
outside, divide, and half. In the Hebrew, whenever you see something, a definition that means half, right away what comes to my mind after studying this for a couple of months now is the sacrifice. Remember when the covenant was made? They, we went over those words last time we met. They sacrificed the animals and split them in half, right? Mm -hmm. Something being divided oh. in half. Watch this. Now, it says outside and divide. What he was telling him here was, and we've seen it translated into break down or uh, break you, he was saying, if you don't take this message into these people, they are going to be outside the rain, they are going to be divided from this land, and the covenant, the pieces, the half will mean nothing any longer with these people. And that's why he said, uh, that's why we need to go over that word arise. What does that mean? Because it's not a bad message. He's just telling them the severity of his mission. These people are fixing to be cut off. We'll see that word many times in the scripture. And these hieroglyphics paint the picture of the context of that verse. You need to go in there because, and as a matter of fact, if you don't follow my word, you're going to fit that category as well. Mm -hmm. If you don't go in there and speak to them all that I've commanded you to speak, you will be outside and divided apart from me as well. That's why he says, I will break you. Now look down here, and what would they, okay, what would they be outside of, and divided, and split from? The definition of that is in the next letter in the top. See, remember, this is a, this, this, the pictures of this and the meanings actually tell us what, the, what he was trying to convey to Yeremiah, just by the research of those two letters. The ta, if you'll notice in what it pictures, is the crossed sticks. And that represents a lot of things to us as believers. Now, remembering the context of the scripture, let's look at the meaning here. This is a mark, a sign, a signal, and a monument. So what he was saying was that himself and these people would be cast outside Divided, right, from the mark, the stake. The stake was a sign for his people. And it was a signal for everybody to repent. And monument means it will remain forever. He was telling you, telling me, telling Jeremy Yahoo to go in there and to convey this message and that it would never change. It is a monument that will stand forever. Once again, explain that one. If the message changed, then Yahweh, according to these hieroglyphic definitions and meanings, wasn't telling him the truth. And that prophet died in vain. Far be it from Yahweh to persecute his people and to tell them to do something that would be changed later and let them die for it. Hallelujah. We don't serve a being like that. There is a purpose for our life, our birth, our life, and our death in this world if we walk according to his ways. He's not going to turn his back on the, on the uh, patriarchs and the prophets and the apostles, nor is he going to turn his back on his people ever. Thank you. Hallelujah. Okay. Now, now we look at the word arise. Arise 
is the Strong's Hebrew number 6965. That Hebrew word is pronounced kum. Kum. Like kumbaya. <laughs> you just see us all around the It's kum. <laughs> it means arise. Kumbaya, ya. Kumbaya. Rise, O Yahweh. That's what that song means. For years, I made a joke out of that. Now I know what it means. It means, y'all arise. Wait a minute. Yeremi Yahoo means what? Yahweh will arise. See, when you look at the Hebrew, you start looking at all this, everything that see is laid out time and time again in the names of the people and in the Hebrew definitions of the words. It's the same message. It's like trying to add one to itself a million times. One plus one plus one plus one. Plus. I mean, it just gets so repetitive after you begin to study this stuff. You see the message. The same message. Hallelujah. Okay, now. So what he was telling him. Here's the definition of that in Strong's. 6965. Sixty-nine, sixty-five is the Hebrew word kum. It means to rise in various applications. And I submit to you, one of those various ap applications of that word was used by our Savior when the little girl... A slight mistranslation, by the way. It's not Tabitha. It's the Hebrew word... Taliha. And if you, we're just going to search that back real quick. Because this is a no hidden fact. A lot of people know this. Right, those guys know about it. But watch, watch where it takes us at closing here. Let's go to that verse. But remember, he's telling, he's telling Jeremy Yahoo to go into these people. Why? Because they were dead. They were living outside of his presence. They were divided and they were fixing to have the kingdom ripped away from them. And what, what good is a house with no family? How lonely to have a house filled with many mansions and behind every single door is an empty room that is decked with silver and gold and bronze. He wants his family back in the mansions. And he's going to bring it to us. He's going to bring it to us. It says, uh, so that's, that's what he was telling those people. You need to go in there to everybody to rise up. They better get out of the dirt and the mud and the mire. They better cleanse themselves. Or they will be divided. And remember the prophecy says that he would call a people that weren't his people. He's not talking about people that he never knew. He's talking about the people he disowned. Mm -hmm. Disowned him. Correct. But he later on divorced mm -hmm. Divorced mm -hmm. right. It wasn't because he failed. It was because we did. Right. Okay. Now, let's go through this real quick so we can close and read the uh, Torah uh, Let's go to Mark chapter 5. Verses 41 through 43 right there. <clears throat> Setting the stage, this is where the uh, he had been called upon, and there was a little girl that had been dead. And a lot of English versions have this recorded as Tabitha Kumi. Uh, but restoring that back to the proper uh, words in the context shows us a bigger picture here.
Verse 41. And taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi. See, there's that word, kumi. So our Savior was showing us something here. Because he said, They're only, she's only asleep. They said, no, no, she's been down a while. But the thing is, she had been covered in something. She had been covered. And that's not her name. It's not a personal name. He's saying, little girl, under the talit, arise. What is a talit? What does it do? Bethany had it over her head when she prayed in. It's a covering. It's, just, it's, it's not his, his actual covering, but it's a sign that we are under his covering when we go to do these things. It might He's saying his she is not dead. She's under a covering. She's going to rise. It's the same message that he was sending Yahoo in to send the good news to because those people had divided themselves and were no longer under the covering. And when you're not under Yahweh's covering, you're in deep. Which is the blood, by the way. And the colleagues covering dead men's bones. And a rock. Shall these dead bones live? Yep. I mean, see, all of these things always go back to the same concept of dry bones, death, Burial, resurrection, covering, it's all got to do with that. Always. And so he says, and taking the child by the hand. Notice that while the child was still on her deathbed, we see a picture of the Savior reaching down and just grabbing her hand and saying, live. And when that dead body received his word, his breath, his ruach, she was under his covering. Her father gave that covering, covering to her. Do you understand that when a child dies, the father brings his covering, his tally, and covers her, him, and puts her under the covering. Why? Because they know about the resurrection. It's, it's symbolic to them when they place that, that talit over the dead. Symbolizing the covering. The covering until what? Until they rise. We'll also show you his confidence in himself about touching a dead body or a leper, for instance. Right. Okay, that's a good point, Brother Vance, because you know what? Um... He, he pronounced it before he touched her. I forgot to, to bring that up. He pronounced that she was alive before he actually touched her. You see what I'm saying? He didn't say, she's dead, and when I touch her, uh-uh. He said, oh no, she's not dead, she's sleeping. He had already awakened her. He had already called her back from the dead at that point. He just reached down and grabbed her head and said, get up. Indeed, when he said she's not dead, life came back into her body. And when he said she's just sleeping, she was asleep. And when he grabbed her hand, right hand, that's in, that's in one of the names that we studied when we started here. The right hand, Jer, uh, Jeremiah chapter 1. Which name was that? That's Benjamin, son of the right hand. See, he pronounced her alive, and that's when life came back into her. By the by his word, she was made alive. He told all of his disciples, by my word, you've been cleansed. By my word, you have life. She was already alive when he said, she's not dead. When he touched her, right hand. When he took her by the hand, that... Right hand, that, that, whole, that whole thing shows power, strength, and authority. She was already alive when he touched her. 
He didn't touch a dead body. He said she's lying. Huh? Hallelujah. Okay, now, I want to go through those verses real quick, or those words. Um, Talitha and Kumi are Hebrew and Aramaic words. And you can... We'll look it up in the Greek first. It's number 5008 in the Greek. And this, this is where we start getting... The little popcorn trail to follow back. Five zero zero eight. In the Greek is Talita of Chaldean or Hebrew origin. Right there, it's telling you it's a Hebrew word. Why? Because it was spoke by a Hebrew man. And it says comparatively to twenty nine twenty four. It means to be fresh. Apply to a young girl. All right. So, it gave us the origin. Now we can go back into the etymology and look at the Hebrew number. That's the Greek number. It's the Hebrew number. 2924. All right. Twenty-nine, twenty-four. Twenty-nine, twenty-four in the Hebrew is Kale. And it comes from twenty-nine, twenty-two. So you see, this is how you study etymology. You're going back to the root, so you get to the primitive root. So you get to the primitive root. It comes from 2922. And 2922 is the, the Hebrew word tel-la. Tel-la. And it comes from 2921, which is a primary root. To cover with pieces. By implication, to spot or variegate a Hebrew tapestry. It's a Hebrew tapestry. What was she wearing? The fathers, that is the root word of tal, tali, talitha. That's not a name. Everybody thought that that was the girl's name, but it was actually a noun, but not a personal noun. It is a thing. It was the father's covering. The father's talit that was on the, on the girl. And what did he tell that little girl that was dead and under the talit? Kumi. What did he tell Jeremy Yahoo to do? Same message, cover to cover. You arise. You have my truth in you, my word. Only my word being delivered to those people can give them life. And the little girl was dead and he said, no, she's alive. Why? Because she's going to receive my word. She's under my covering. And that kumi... In the Greek, we'll give you the same corresponding number that goes back to the Hebrew. It's, it's a, of a Hebrew root, which is the Hebrew word number 6966. 
in the Hebrew. That's kumi. That's what the Greek word kum will take you back to. The Hebrew word, uh, I'm out of room. The Hebrew word, kumi. So you'll see that they transliterated all that pretty well, but when they came to the name of the Father and Son, they just threw them out the window. Yeah. Hallelujah. So here we see, by the, by the study of the, of the language and the context, that the same message is being conveyed from Yahu to Yahshua, through Yahshua, and to His disciples. And if we are His disciples, we are supposed to be bringing the same exact message now. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Not bad. <laughs> All good. Amen. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And as we begin to read uh, the Torah portions for this week, we give you praise. We thank you for the, uh, the fellowship, the music, the sounding of the shofar. We thank you for everybody that was here. We love you so much. And we thank you for your Shabbat. We pray that you would bless all of the Mishpachal throughout the world. For coming together and worshiping you on your set apart day. Mm -hmm. And we thank you for the command to kumi, to arise, to hear your word. Give us strength and boldness to declare these things and lead us by your spirit in order to do so. And we pray this all in the name of Yahshua, our Messiah. Amen. Amen.